Yeah, in this talk I'm mostly discussing um, what's coming out of my PhD that I'm doing at the moment in the University of York, uh, which is looking at connections between critical heritage theory, national legislation and policy, and um, heritage in practice in archaeology, museums work, conservation, and so on. Um, and I'm trying to find out what impact changing theories had on the way that heritage is perceived and managed more widely and how those ideas get shared between different branches of the sector. Um, still very much an ongoing project, so what I'm going to be doing today is really throwing out a lot of big questions, and if anyone has any answers, so I'll be very receptive to hearing them. Um, so I'm going to start really by laying out what I mean by critical heritage theory, um, why we kind of need to ask questions about how it communicates with the rest of the sector, um, and then I'll do a brief, I promise, brief overview of how I'm going to kind of gather ideas and develop that during my PhD. And finally, what I think we can achieve. So, critical heritage theory is relatively recent as an academic strand. The name was really created by Rodney Harrison in 2010, but largely it comes out of the kind of cultural turn in the arts and humanities um, in the later 20th century. So, it pulls together strands from lots of different academic disciplines, like archaeology, particularly kind of post processual strands of archaeology, and sociology. Geography, philosophy, um, so on, more or less. And um, fundamentally, obviously, there are a lot of variations within it, but these are the things that I feel really identify critical heritage theory as its own individual strand. So it's constructivist, fundamentally, rather than assuming that heritage is an intrinsic quality, which um, is sort of measurable and inherent within objects. It argues that it is created and recognised through human interactions with their environment. And because of that, it's flexible and it changes over generations and um, is also very fundamentally subjective. So what I recognise as heritage would not be what someone else would recognise as heritage. And one thing can contain multiple different types of heritage as different people associate with it for different reasons. Um, it's also politically aware, as Harold Fredholm argues there. Um, probably never more so than in Smith's Authorised Heritage Discourse, which she explained in her book, Uses of Heritage, in 2006, um, where she said that not only does heritage matter, but also that heritage, however we may define it, has high political stakes, because it's very tied up with our um, cultural and social identities, and becomes a tool in struggles for recognition and political and economic control. So that's obviously very connected to lots of debates about things like the management of indigenous heritage, um, the representation of disempowered and minority <coughs> groups within heritage, um, and obviously lots of ideas that we're all quite familiar with already here. And um, finally, it asks very broad questions. So it doesn't just ask how to manage heritage, but how to define what heritage is, why we select one piece of the past to protect as heritage and not another piece why we protect and manage some of these pieces and leave others for their own devices, um, why we make the conservation decisions we do, and who makes these decisions, who gives them the right to make the decisions, who is affected by the consequences of the decisions. So these are big questions. I know, well, I know lots of people here have discussed them because I had quite a lot of discussion yesterday. Um, and I know lots of people will have been aware of these questions, will have dealt with them in a lot of individual situations. The kind of unique contribution that theory has to make, I believe, is that rather than dealing with big questions as individual situations arise, it's our job to identify systematic issues, to look at the full spectrum of heritage, um, full time. You know, that's our job. We sit back and we go, what are the problems? How can we solve them? And that's not something that anyone else really gets the time or the resources to do. What we don't know is how many of these very useful ideas we're coming out with are actually travelling outside the sort of academic sphere of discussion. Um, so we don't know whether we're sharing these effectively with archaeologists and museum workers and conservation officers who can actually put them into practice. Um, and this is really a question I was forced to ask when I started studying cultural heritage because I've been working in heritage tourism sites for years 
before I started doing heritage theory. And no one ever mentioned these. They mentioned things like how to get visitors through the door and, you know, how to make sure that the ropes are all in place so that none of the artifacts get damaged. And that was just how it operated and how it had always operated. So a lot of these academic ideas were completely new to me. And we don't really have an easy way of measuring changes in attitudes or in ideas. So it's very hard to know what impact we're having. But if our ideas aren't being used, why aren't they being used? Is it because of how we're communicating our ideas? So is it that theorists are all very busy publishing very expensive books and in very big paywall journals and we don't talk to people actually on the ground? If our ideas are put out at inaccessible prices and in really dense theoretical language, who in practice has the time or the resource to find these and work their way through them when they've also got targets to hit and jobs to do? So then if we're not connecting with people in practice, how do we know our ideas are useful? You know, we think they're great, but what looks really simple as a recommendation in an academic paper has to be practical for the site manager who needs to get visitors through the door or the conservation officer with a big stack of paperwork to get through in no time. And particularly in an austerity economy, there's lots of heritage organisations who are really stretched for staff and for funding and are just trying to get on with their jobs, let alone reinvent themselves as politically radical organisations. Um, so I am finally wondering if inadvertently theorists are actually alienating practitioners within the heritage sector, because we're criticizing you know, the system as a whole and we want to improve it and we want to make it better. But if we're criticizing practitioners for doing their jobs, then we're just creating rifts rather than trying to bridge them. So I'm arguing that there needs to be improved communication both ways between theorists and practitioners. So it's not just about how theorists share their ideas with the rest of the sector and how we push them out but also how we listen to the issues and the problems that practitioners are facing so that we can find ways to use the time and the resources that we have to develop really practically applicable, accessible ways to deal with the issues that people are facing in the day-to-day. -day. So that's been the basis of my PhD work. Um, how have these ideas developed alongside heritage <coughs> dissertation and policy, and alongside practice, and what impact have they made? So mostly, so far, I'm only one year in, so I've mostly focused around the first question, which is um, how ideas kind of spread through discussion in the past. So I'm comparing lots of journal and conference abstracts mm -hmm. over the past about kind of 25 years to see how often different terms are used. So things like you know, authenticity or intangibility or even the authorised heritage discourse, how often do we use that in heritage mm -hmm. journals and then how often do we use them in archaeology journals, museum journals, conservation journals. And um, what I would really like to see is whether there are trends which shows ideas getting discussed frequently in one discipline and then coming through and getting discussed in another discipline. And they're coming through. And if they're not getting passed from one area of academic discussion to another, why not? You know, why aren't we sharing these ideas if we think they're useful? <coughs> and I'm also trying to put these on a kind of timeline so that I can compare them to political context at the time to see if ideas that get discussed a lot within academic theory then show up in guidance documents and policy documents or um, if actually the reverse is happening. So usually you're coming out with policy ideas and um, steers from government and then academic theory is reacting to that. You know, so suddenly we've all got to focus on Big society or sustainability is that in response to political contexts rather than pushing the heritage that we want to see? Um, so, and then to look more kind of at how theories influence practice rather than conference oh, theory, I'm looking at um, I'm going to send a questionnaire out to local government conservation officers, archaeologists, and um, try and find out how much general awareness there is of the ideas of critical heritage theory which will give me some idea of how well it's been communicated and then are these ideas being used? If not, why not? You know, are they just not practical? Are they not usable? Um, 
So that will also highlight variability within the system to show you know, where individual viewpoints or the resources available in particular areas will change how practice is done within this sort of overarching system. So is the extent to which these theoretical ideas used really just down to how much individual person like? Um, and also using the archives in the Council of British Archaeology to look at sort of the discussion and debate which has formulated some of the policy ideas that we have um, so that I can see who's influenced the heritage policy that we have at the moment. How did that debate come about and how did different ideas get voiced? Um, and finally, to get some kind of nuance into the picture, I'm planning to interview some of the questionnaire response respondents and um, other heritage professionals to find out how I can put these ideas um, really in context, in practice, because um, no one can tell me better about the pressures and the challenges and the changes that happen within heritage and the people who are doing it full time. Um, and that's um, really where I am at the moment. And I'm hoping out of all that to come out with an idea of which communication methods have been effective, and how people have learnt about changing ideas. Is it through conferences like this? Have they been reading academic journals? Did they find out through interpersonal connections? Um, and then I'm hoping to build on that to kind of create a system which will allow these ideas to be more accessible and to be communicated more effectively. And that's what I hoped, in a big picture sense, to get in the future, to get closer links between heritage theory and heritage practice. So we can share ideas in a way which are useful and um, so that we can make a positive impact on the heritage sector. And also, I want to encourage a more inclusive culture within critical heritage theory, just like it prescribes the rest of the sector. I want to get a wider variety of voices heard within the theory. So I want to feel that um, theorists and practitioners are both getting the chance to say what they think and how they feel about the ideas that are coming out. Um, particularly, you know, heritage practitioners will have very legitimate feedback and criticism to make about the work produced by theory. But we need to hear that and we need to get that feedback into our work so that then we can respond to the rest of the sector rather than floating up our own little academic cloud. Um, so I want to avoid developing a rift between the critical theory and the criticised practitioners and so we can develop positive links um, and cooperative ways of moving forward. If anyone has any feedback, any further ideas, I will be very grateful to hear them. Do come talk to me, get in contact. Thank you.